YouTube, it's Missy, and today I'm here to share with you guys my January wrap-up for 2021. I'm very excited and uh, proud of myself for how many books I was able to accomplish in the month of January. Now, I know that I did have the first two weeks off of January, so that kind of gives me a little bit more leverage in the reading department, although... That is also the same two weeks I decided that I was going to re-scan um, all of my books in my entire collection onto a new app, and that took about a week. So I wasn't reading the whole two weeks I had off in January, but I did get through eight books. Um, I continued, well, I started one, I continued three more. Um, and I'll go over those at the end. So I want to start with the one that I don't own, and that is Shiloh by Phyllis Reynolds Naylor. Um, I read this to my third grade class, and it took us about, I want to say two weeks to read the entire thing. I think I was reading maybe two chapters a day, so maybe ten days to read it, and it was actually like... I don't know. I wanted to say cute, but it's not very a cute story. I mean, it has a happy ending, but it's more of a, I don't know, like a family drama for little kids. It is, like I said, it is um, third graders that I read this to. And the third graders were reading this book on their own as well, so it's definitely age appropriate. Um, Shiloh is about a boy named Marty who lives in a poorer part of town. He has, um, his father is the mailman, and I think his mom's a teacher. I don't remember if that's what she was. But they had three kids, and they lived in like a two-bedroom house where the mom and dad got to stay in one room, the sisters got a room, and then poor Marty had to sleep on the couch in the living room. Um, and they kind of just like grew food and lived off the land as much as they could. But there was a part of the book where um, Marty's going to the store and Mr. Wallace sees that he's trying to buy like um, expired meat and cheese. But he's doing that to you know, buy the food for a dog, but Miss, Mr. Wallace thinks that it's for uh, Marty's family, and so people ha will, like, leave food in the mailbox for Marty's dad when he comes around town, you know, dropping off the mail. People will leave, like, pies or, like, leftovers or whatever. So they are on the poorer side, and, um, Marty has a best friend that lives in a richer area, and um, he has rooms to spare. I mean, there's one room that's an entire library, which um, he's boasting to his mom because he just thinks David Howard is so cool with all of his rooms. And the mom's like, ah, eh, that's too many rooms. Like, she's trying to downplay it, but you can tell she's a little bit jealous. And then there is the final character of the story, who is Judd Travers. And he is a wicked man who abuses his animals. Now, there is a little bit of animal cruelty in the story, not necessarily that you see, but you hear of past um, transgressions. And so if you don't want to hear about dogs getting hurt by an abusive um, owner, um, you might not want to pick the book up or if you don't want your children to read that kind of stuff. It's it's mainly like kicking and there's nothing like super graphic because this is a book for third graders. Um, but there is a little bit of violence. And the dad says to Marty at one point in the book that um, that Judd Travers might be a really bad guy, but he's not the only one. So it's not like Marty can go around and save every dog. There are so many bad um, people out there and Marty feels really bad for the dog that he doesn't want um, to be abused anymore by Judd Travers. But the moral of the story is uh, like what do you think about animal cruelty? Do you think you can change the way somebody is? Um, do you think it's okay to lie even if it's lying for a good reason? 
um, and then working hard and and paying off like a debt even though it seems hopeless or pointless to continue but you know following through and sticking to like a, a verbal agreement and not backing down on that um, just shows integrity and um, bravery when it comes to like say there, Judd Travers is a bully and he does bully um, Marty several times throughout the book so uh, it's not that long it's about a hundred or so pages um, like I said it took me 10 days reading two chapters a day to the kids to finish the book and I gave it 3.5 stars I mean it's a kids book it's not designed for me um, I thought the book was overall um, easy to read there was a good message and it's set in West Virginia and it's really funny because my best friend from high school is from West Virginia and when I would talk to her my southern accent would come out because um, I did live in Georgia for a little over a year when I was in fifth and sixth grade and you might say well so but somehow you know, at my 10 and 11 year old self, I really picked up that twang, um, that southern drawl uh, pretty quickly. And I haven't seen videos of myself from when I was that small, but um, my mom told me once that she just, she had, she had to keep playing it over and over again because she couldn't get it, she couldn't understand how I talked with that accent so fast. And it's probably just because. I tend to mimic around me those accents that I hear. I don't know if you do that too. If if I never do it on purpose, it just ends up happening. Um, but yeah, I said dog a lot because <laughs> I always wanted one when I was living in Georgia. Anywho, what I'm trying to say is that I did read the book to the children in a southern accent. And it got to the point where... I would get after the two chapters and um, I wouldn't be able to stop and I'd be like, okay, it's time to move on and, and, and do math or something. And I was still talking in a Southern accent. It's hard to take off once you put it on. Um, but yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it. I gave it, you know, three, 3.5 stars. It's, it's good for kids. Um, and then the rest of the books that I'm going to share with you are the ones that I physically own. The first one I want to talk about is My Neighbor Totoro by Hayao Miyazaki. Hayao? I don't know if that's right. Hayao. And Zukiko Kubo, possibly. He's the illustrator. Um, this is one of my favorite, absolute favorite movies from Studio Ghibli. I love My Neighbor Totoro. I think it's because it's about two sisters. And even though I have two, I have two sisters, my youngest sister didn't grow up with me. I'm almost 20 years older than she is. I'm like 19 and a half years older than she is. And so she was born when I was in college. So it, my my middle sister... Christina, the one that lives in New Zealand, um, it was just her and I up until college. And so it just, it makes me think of me and my sister. Although, um, Sa oh, wait a minute. Satsuki, Satsuki. <coughs> Satsuki is 11 and her little sister May is four, three or four. I think it's four. Um, so they have quite a big difference in age, but um, May loves her older sister, and her older sister really is a good big sister, and she does take care of her and helps her dad out. Um, if you've never seen this movie, oh, you really need to. It's about two little girls who move from Tokyo to a small village outside of a hospital for people who have tuberculosis. Now in the movie it doesn't talk about why the girls' mom is in the hospital. It just says that they're, that she's sick and so we just assume she's got cancer or something. But in the book um, she has tuberculosis. And so instead of having to go from Tokyo to this hospital near this small village 
um, which used to take forever because they would have to um, take a long train ride and then take a different couple of buses and then, you know, go across that way. It used to take all day to see their mom, whereas the village that they moved to is like an hour and a half away by bicycle. <laughs> so it's very easy to get to their mom, and so they're able to visit her like every weekend. Um, so yeah, the mom's sick. The dad is an archaeologist, and he is a professor, and he works at the university. And so he has this thing where sometimes he has to leave early in the morning. And remember, the girls are 11 and 4. And to me, that doesn't seem like a bad thing, because when I was 9, I was, like, literally taking care of four other children, five, five other children below me that... Um, varied in ages. So it was my cousin who was a year younger and then my sister and his sister was three years younger and then there was two babies. There was a toddler and then a, like a, a baby baby um, when I was nine. And I had to watch all of these kids at nine years old. I was changing diapers. I was bottle feeding. I was, you know, burping, sleeping in cribs to make sure that the babies weren't um, scared or upset because all of the grown-ups in my house in the early 90s all had to work. And because I was the oldest grandkid, I had to watch all of these tiny children. So I can see Satsuki having to do this to her sister May, like having to like light a fire, make breakfast, pack lunches, like get her sister ready all the time. The dad's super busy. And so Satsuki is kind of just like a, um, like a mama hen to her little sister and what a big help for the mom since she's stuck in the hospital but anyways I I'm going on a tangent so this movie is surrounding the whole part about the sisters loving each other they have a really good family life they really miss their mom and then right outside the new house that they purchased is Totoro who is the guardian of the forest and um and he reveals himself to the girls. And it's such a treat because he's like half rabbit, half raccoon, half cat. And there's a cat bus. And there's all these little tiny soot sprites or soot spirits. And there's baby Totoros. They're all so stinking cute. They're all just forest creatures, forest spirits. And I just love this movie so much. And May is really sad and she wants to go see her mom and she gets lost. And Totoro helps find her. And it's just so sweet. And I gave this book five stars. That was a long um, rant for a children's book. Pardon me. All right, the next book that I read, this was to fulfill... Oh, by the way... I read this for the If You Got It, Read It um, book challenge from the Spinebreakers. I'm doing the bonus of Read Everything in the Same Shelf. Um, and then I picked up The Room by Jonas Carlson. Uh, this is set in, I think, Sweden. Yeah, it's set in Sweden. So this is about a man named Bjorn. And it's funny because I thought Bjorn was the baby carrier. I mean, it is the baby carrier. I owned one. But I, I, is it anybody who lives in Sweden or from Sweden or has family who live in Sweden or just know Swedish things? Is Bjorn a brand name or is it like calling your product Bob and that's just a common Swedish name? And then they just added, they just put that on a baby carrier. They just called it, like, like Bob Strollers, you know? They just called it Bob. Let me know down below if Bjorn is a popular name. Um, so our main character's name is Bjorn. He had worked someplace else, but then he got sent to this building, which is called The Authority. I don't know what that stands for, if he works for the government or some other kind of office job. But he gets stuck in the middle of a open... Um, floor plan office. There's no cubicles or anything. It's just like desks, like two desks next to each other and then people have their own little groupings. And um, our main character is just a little odd. I found this book to be absolutely hilarious because our main character Bjorn acts exactly like my husband acts. Like 
kind of a know-it-all Hermione kind of character. <laughs> My husband's like this, where he waltzes in. He goes, I know what's going on. I can do it. And um, that's what Bjorn does. He he has this like chip on his shoulder because he kind of knows that he's good. Um, but the, so he analyzes the entire office, like what the people are doing, how they dress. Like he's got critiques and and he's like judging everybody in this office. And um, one day when he's heading towards the bathrooms, he sees this door along the wall. And he's curious because he 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 was looking for copy paper at one point in the story, and he opens the door to look to see if there's copy paper inside, and it's just an office that has a desk and a filing cabinet. There's like a lamp and all these like pens or whatever, um, but nobody uses this office. And sooner or later, he decides that he's gonna use this office for himself for like a mental break like he's gonna go in there five minutes at a time five seven minutes at a time and he's just gonna relax and like think about the job and like decompress and meditate for a few and um weeks go by and the people in his office start kind of wigging out that he's been doing this and finally his desk mate goes uh, what do you do in the hallway? And Bjorn's like, what do you mean? And he says, well, you're just standing there. And Bjorn's like, what are you talking about? And the guy's like, e everybody can see you. You're just, you're just standing there. And you're just like zoning out, almost drooling somewhat. You're, you're, you're just stand, and it, it's really freaking everybody out. And that's all I'm going to say about the book, because then I'll give it away. But it's it, it's such a strange story. On the back, it says that um, people wanted to say that this was kind of like the office or office space, like the TV show or the movie. And it's not. There's no, like, silly slapstick kind of humor in this. There's no Dwight's. Um, it's, it's not like parks and recreation where you have an office space that you can like laugh at your employees. There's no laughing situations in here. It's just odd, dry humor with a guy who thinks he's better than everybody else but might be mentally unstable. And it makes me laugh because that's my husband. Um, <clears throat> I love my husband, but... Because I love him so much, I get to pick on him. And that, they're, they're the same person. So I gave that book four stars. I know some people gave it one star. And that's, again, another way you can tell that books just speak to people differently. You know? Because I gave this a four. Somebody thought this was real crap and gave it one. Or DNF'd it and they said they couldn't even understand what why they were reading this story. There's no like real point it's just about a man who works in an office and what he does there and how he gets promoted and how he has squabbles with his um desk mate and the other employees that's basically it it's just office drama with a twist but it's so interesting i like learning about people i should have been a sociologist i like learning about people i like watching people i like reading about situations and that one was a lot of fun all right the next book that i read was siri who am i and this is by sam um we know that i can't pronounce that i want to say it's cheetah cheetah something maybe there's no t maybe i don't say the t um but this is about a girl named uh oh my god is her name mia i almost called her maya her name is mia she gets um a head trauma. She gets in this accident. Not a car accident, but she's at this party. Something happens. She gets whisked away in an ambulance. Um, she ends up being in a coma for like 12 to 24 hours. And then when she comes to, she doesn't remember who she is or where she lives or what she does, what her name is. She knows nothing. Um, but she does know how to use a cell phone, and so she decides that she's going to go through her broken cell phone 
and figure out what, who she is through Instagram. She's the Sherlock Holmes we never asked for. Um, she, it, I liked this story for the most part. I mean, this is a chiclet contemporary um, romance novel, and I don't usually like reading those, and I borrowed, not borrowed, I, I did ask um, Quark Books for this book. I requested it because I thought it sounded funny, you know, because it has the whole technology in it. And it was, for the most part, it was very entertaining to read. It didn't take that long. It took me five days to read it. Um, I've already made a whole review on this book, so I will leave that link down below. But just know that it was okay. I gave it... I gave it 3.5 stars, and I hope one of you like it, because I'm going to put this in the giveaway pile. The next book I completed was The House on Vesper Sands by Perrick. I believe that's how you pronounce the first name. O'Donnell. Ooh, I almost got stabbed in the eye. Um, I was sent this by Tin House Publishing. Uh, the synopsis hooked me, and when they asked if I wanted to read it, I had to say yes. I also have a full review of this and I will leave that video link down below as well. Um, but I gave this five stars. This was my my first five star read of the month. The second one was My Neighbor Totoro. And this is about um, two sets of people who end up working together at the end. So we have a detective or an inspector. Um, there's an inspector cutter, and then we have his sergeant, um, Gideon Bliss, and they are looking to figure out where Gideon's friend is, and where is his uncle, and why did the seamstress die? Like, we don't know if she killed herself by jumping out of the window, or if she was murdered and pushed out the window. We don't know. The two men are going around trying to figure it out. And then we have um, our other set of people. We have, what's her name? Octavia. I was going to call her Abigail. Abigail's from Jacoby. Sorry. Octavia is a journalist, and she works for the Gazette, and she's trying to figure out where Lord Strife is, Where's the missing girls, and who are the spiriters? And she learns all of that while on the hunt for the same missing girl as Inspector Cutter and Gideon Bliss. So because they're both searching for the same girl, they end up working together at the end. And I really, really enjoyed the entire book. Um... It was great. I loved it. And so I will be giving this one also away in the trade away pile and I'm going to buy myself a hardcover of the book because I did enjoy it so much. The next book that I completed was The Man from the Train, Discovering America's Most Elusive Serial Killer by Bill James and his daughter Rachel McCarthy James. This is 466 pages of a lot of information. Now, um, Bill James is a sports writer, so from him writing about like the statistics of sports and the process of sports, like baseball, and then writing a nonfiction on serial killers is such a stretch. Um, although, he did do a lot of research for this information. Uh, I still find it very biased. Uh, you know, like he's telling us who he thinks the killer is and why, and we're just supposed to believe him. Now, granted, he did do a lot of research, so I came up with my own conclusions on who the man from the train is because it is discussed um, at the end, but this man was serial killing people since the 1900s up until 1924, I think. Um, but his main years was 1910 through 1912. And he killed 
150 people or something like that. Or, you know, all of the stories that could have been linked to the man from the train killed about 150 people. But like Bill was saying in the story or in this nonfiction writing, that um, things have trends. So if someone strangles women to death, then more men, serial killers, will strangle women to death because they've seen somebody else do it and either they idolize the past killers or they want to do a, like a copycat or that just gives them a good idea like, oh yeah, I never thought about strangling somebody. So in the 1910s, um, there really wasn't much weaponry that was easily accessible. Uh, like they didn't have like nail guns or something. An axe was easily accessible. It was already outside next to the chopped wood because there was so many wood burning stoves. So easy access. The man from the train would just grab an axe and slaughter the whole household. Everybody, doesn't matter if you were a baby, um, there was a one day old that got murdered all the way up until, you know, grandparents. Uh, the man did not discriminate. He killed old and young, male and female, white and black. It didn't matter. He killed everybody in the house. And he didn't even know who you were. Just if, if you were there, you're dead. And um, he did it for a really long time. And they never caught him. And uh, so it was very interesting. Although very long-winded. Uh, this book could have been 200 pages less. I did give it four stars because... I did enjoy the process of going through and reading all of the dates and trying to figure out if it was the same man or if it was somebody that was similar who was just, you know, not necessarily copying him, but there was a lot of train hoppers back then that could just come and go as they pleased. There was no real policing to, you know, I mean, the trains did have their own police department because people did jump off and jump on all the time and they were trying to arrest people who were trying to ride for free but at the same time it was kind of easy to do and so people did it and um, yeah there was no real police back then towns would investigate if they wanted to if the family put in some kind of ransom like not a ransom but like a, a reward for figuring out who the killer was um, then sometimes the city or state or the town would match it. And, uh, yeah, I gave it four stars. Very interesting. Uh, and I buddy read that with Ashley. All right, and then I read Who's There? A Collection of Stories by Dimas Rio. Um, he is a Indonesian author. He sent this book to me. I thought it was really good. I gave it 3.75 stars. I typically don't give short story collections extremely high ratings because not all short stories are going to be interesting to the reader. I did enjoy a few of them. Not all, but a few. Uh, I think there's five in here. Let me double check. Who's there at dusk? The Wandering, The Voice Canal, and The Forest Protector. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Um, I, I, I think The Wandering was my favorite, but I read this at the beginning of the month, so I can't quite remember. Um, but the cool thing about reading books and reviewing them is that I have proof that I read it. So <laughs> I will leave all of the Goodreads reviews down below as well so you can check out what I wrote as soon as I was done with the book because everything was fresh in my mind then. And I can edit while I'm writing something and say, uh, well that sounds stupid, let's make it sound more eloquent. Although I can't speak that way, um, I can write well. And so I did enjoy that collection of short stories. I did read this to fulfill the read one publisher and one author book 
in every month. That was on my 2020 reading uh, goals for this year. So I did accomplish that. And then the last book that I completed in January was Obsidio, the third and final book in the Illumine uh, Files by Amy Kaufman and Jay Kristoff. I started this series back in 2016. The first one, Illumine, came out, or Illumina, Illumine, came out in January, and then that November I picked up Gemina, and I gave each book five stars. The first book is a, um, a sci-fi horror. We have two ships, or there's more than one ship. But okay, so there's, there's the good guys, and then there's the bad guys, and then there's an evil AI system that is psychotic and murdering people. And it's like in space, and you never know if you're going to die next. Um, that was the horror book. And then Gemina comes, and we there's that whole aftermath of the first book, and then we're heading towards a new section of the universe where, where um, the Hemdale Way Station is. It's a jump porting system, so you can go to different galaxies or different star systems. Uh, it's a waypoint. And um, the bad guys from the first book have infiltrated the way station because they don't want the survivors from the first book to sneak through the waypoint and tell the police what happened, right? They don't want civilization to know what went down because both sides were doing something illegal. And uh, so it, that book, the Gemina, was a sci-fi action thriller, you know? It was like, um, like Die Hard, but in space, but John McClane was a woman and a teenager at the same time. <laughs> uh, yeah, H Hannah Donnelly is kind of like John McClane. So we have that whole aspect. And then we come to Obsidio, and I'm thinking, you know, I've read so many um, books, so many YA series that start off strong, they get a five star, and then the middle book gets like a four star, and then the third book gets a three star, and the ending is crap, right? This one proved it wrong. I gave this book a five star as well. I am so excited to have finished the series. Finally, it only took five years to pick up the third book, even though I pre-ordered this when it came out. Um, so this is both stories put together, but in different situations. So not only is this a sci-fi horror, but it's also a sci-fi action. It takes, it takes all the good stuff from book one and all of the good stuff from book two and puts it in and makes it awesome. And there's great dialogue. And I love all the teenagers. Normally I don't like the teenagers and I love all the teenagers in here. And uh, Katie's dad is amazing, and oh my gosh, Ezra and Nick, they're just so cute. Uh, I just loved everything about this story. So it all, it just definitely earned five stars in my book. Those are all the books that I read in the month of January, and then I'm going to share with you guys what I picked up but didn't finish. So I did read The Ballad of Black Tom. I picked it up back in December. I think I only read like five pages and then I read uh, 44 pages or no 44 minus 5. Math's hard. 40? 39? 40? 41? 42? 43? 44? Yes, 39. <laughs> okay, uh, so I read 39 pages in January, and I do want to pick it up and finish it this month in February. And then I did pick up The Cuckoo's Calling again. I, this, I've been working on this book for like three or four years now. Um, I think I read maybe 50 or 100 pages in January, and so I definitely want to finish this up this month. If that is possible, that would be great. I have already read Dreamcatcher in the past, but I did want to try and read it with my group 
this month, but I only got 56 pages into the story, which you see all these like wonderful tabs. I was supposed to read like so many pages each week and I just, I picked up all the other ones. So I didn't finish this one. And then I was planning on reading all of Bizarre of Bad Dreams. I only read 106 pages of this one. So I didn't even complete um, the Buzzwordathon in January because these are both dream books and I didn't finish it. And then I didn't even pick up What Dreams May Come by Richard Matheson. So those three dream books need to be rolled over. I'm going to, what I'm thinking about doing is not ending things, but God, that movie was so bad. Um, what I'm thinking about doing is every month that I have leftover books that I had put on my TBR and I didn't finish, that I'm just going to keep picking up the books. Like, instead of just putting them on the floor or putting them on the graveyard shelf, I'm just going to pick them up, like, every day and read a page or a couple pages or every week and read a chapter from all of the books. And then, slowly but surely, I will finish the, the story. It, it doesn't matter when, but I'll eventually finish it this year instead of it just sitting on my shelf for years and years and years. So... Those are all the books that I read, all the books that I started or attempted to finish. And um, that is everything. I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you guys have a great weekend. And I will talk to you soon. Thank you so much for watching. Bye!